Hey guys, this is Attorney Walter Knott. We are live now for the section of the video where we basically go ahead and uh, have people uh, ask questions live from the telephone where they call the 407-279-1754 phone number. And we go ahead and answer any legal question they have about social security disability benefits, whether it's SSI or SSDI benefits. We have the first person on the phone, but you guys know the rules. The rules are very simple. It's a five to seven minute phone call uh, for basically the quick live phone calls of this session. We do it every Thursday, but you have to use a fake name throughout this process. Now we've got the first person on the line. Uh, good, sir. Uh, would you like me to answer a specific question or would you like me to run hearing questions with you go ahead okay yes this is mike weaver um i well i got a question i, I already draw ssdi and uh, i got a review coming up okay uh december the 20th and 23 and uh my question is uh, i've been working for east i've been working for easter seal uh, for 10 years uh, I'm just trying to see what would they do. Could, could, could you give me some information? I'm blind and vision impaired. So you're saying that you're currently, you are currently working or no? Right, I am currently working. Okay, gotcha. And they're doing a review, uh, basically, to see if you're still severely impaired uh, to keep receiving your SSDI or SSI benefits. Yes, but they already know that I work for Easter Seal. Okay. Are you on a ticket to work program or are you, it's 10 years. So, I mean, you must've been working there beyond the ticket to work program if you were on it. Right. I, I don't have now. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, how much are you earning per month? Uh, 1701. 1701. Yeah. So basically that would be over the $1,470. So, uh, in that case, they might be looking to say that you are over SGA, which is substantial gainful activity. Oh, right, right. You're vision impaired. So you got a much higher one. Yeah. So you've kept it under right. that. Um, so you're right. worried essentially about, uh, now, okay, did you get a short form? Did you get a long form or have they not sent you a form yet? Not yet. Okay, cool. So the bottom line with visually impaired individuals is that usually before they have an upcoming CDR, they'll go to the, any, you know, eyesight clinic to go ahead and get a current reading. And with eyes, you know, it could be that you have difficulty seeing in the left part of the eye, the right part of the eye, straight down the center, the upper part, the lower I'm part. I'm blind in one eye. Okay. And so the expectation with the listing level criteria is that the other eye, it, you could only see the big E at the top of the chart. So how is the other eye? So how does that limit your sight? Uh, 280. Mm, okay. So, okay. Bottom line is, you know, now when you filed, did you have other impairments as well or no? No. And okay. I didn't uh, have to go have no lawyer or nothing. I, they just sent me some papers and I filled them out mm -hmm. and sent them back in. So bottom to the, uh, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They sent me the form, I filled them out, sent them back in, I went to their doctor Okay. that they sent me to. With this other eye, can you tell me, uh, you know, like, how does, with the eye that has some eyesight to it, how is it limiting your, your, your visual ability to see, like, the left corner, the right corner, upward, downward, or straight ahead? Uh, I mean, it's just blurry. I mean, it's like I see little things. I guess it, it's not real what I see. It's like little things falling or something, little balls or something every now and then. So uh, I drive, but I can't drive at night. So you still are able to drive. Okay, wow. All right. How long ago were you found disabled? Uh, 2009. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so you were found disabled during a much more liberal era. Um just so you know, they'd be looking at essentially the 2.04 loss of visual efficiency based listings. Uh, they would be looking at essentially a, a visual efficiency percentage of 20 or less after best correction. So remember, one eye's got to be blind, and the other one, this is the one we're talking about, the good eye. Or B, a visual impairment value of one or greater after best correction. So what I would say is this, you have to be adjudicated under the rules that were back during that era. The issue right. you sometimes run into <clears throat> is that essentially, you know, when they adjudicate pay, uh, people now, nowadays, the judges are much less liberal when even reviewing the older rules. 
So what a lot of people get worried about is essentially, you know, getting reviewed by less liberal judges that are going to be more uh, aggressive and stringent with their, you know, approvals. However, yeah, yeah. I didn't go for it, Judge Tony, last time. You, you didn't go? I mean, I didn't. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't go for it, Judge. I just filled it out and sent it in and went to the doctor and they approved me. Yep. Yeah. So what happens is you'll go before what's considered a DDS rep who will then send you to a CEME, which will be specifically for your eyesight. And that CEME right. will you know, do a test to see what your capacity to actually you know, see is. Now, this could be a thing beyond just visual efficiency in the sense of you know, how far you can see. This might be a thing where you have a limited ability to see different areas of what the eye's coverage normally would be. This might be a thing where you have floaters all over the place and you can't you know, really focus on a particular thing. Although the thing that worries me is that when you say you have the ability to drive with one eye that's, you know, at that rate, that is a surprising evidence that I wouldn't expect for somebody with that eyesight level. Um, so, right. yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the bottom line is you'll go see their doctor, uh, but it would be advisable to go get an eye test and outline all the limitations that you have when it comes to, and it could be anything. It could be blurriness on the left side, the right side, upper bottom. It could be color dis, um, color um, or discoloration when it comes to you know the types of colors that you're seeing and how your eye visually sees it. It could be floaters. It could be things that are spots in the eyes that are stopping the ability to see in a particular area. You want to outline all of those to a doctor to get an eyesight test because that is the evidence that you will use to counter what their doctor will use against you. Okay, okay, okay. Got that. Okay. And what about me working? So basically, you know, you're under the SGA um, right. and you're SSDI, right? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, you should be okay because you're under SGA. Um, and look, how old are you right, right now? How old am I? Yeah. 59. 59. Yeah, man, you got like two or three more years and they're not going to care. They're not going to be doing CDRs anymore. You got to make it through this one, maybe one more tops and then you're done. Then it's, they're not going to be looking to you. Right. But I didn't have my first one already. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. You have 2009. You've had to have one by now. Yeah. I had, to have, I had one in 16. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so right. seven years for blind individuals where their eyesight's really bad is pretty much commonplace for application. But also remember, back in 2009 and, and earlier, a lot of the reviews were set at seven-year intervals or just no intervals at all. So you know, that was very commonplace, but now that they have computer systems that are able to really like schedule these things out and automate a lot of it. The bottom line is a lot more people are seeing, you know, the one year, the three year options as well. But look, you might have one more. You probably won't, but you might have one more up to like 63 ish. But then at that point, they're not they're not going to be very interested in doing another one. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. OK, because I'm 59 now. And I think I'm a 47 or something when I start drawing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you should be good. Um, I'm really glad to hear that you put the effort in to go ahead and, and get a, a job while doing it. It's it's an amazing thing for a blind person to basically take that extra step and do a job. Um, don't give us too much detail, but what type of job are you currently doing? Uh, I clean. What do you clean? I yeah. Clean. Yeah, I clean so, uh, at a rest area. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very yeah, cool. I, I, that's all I do is clean. Uh, that's what I do. I'm a, I'm a tenant, cleaning attendant. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, the custodial work, is awesome job. And, and then, you know, that's super important, um, you know, and, and we really appreciate that because, you know, a, you know, I don't know if it's for like a highway or a rest stop or it's, you know, a government building or a facility or some other commercial building, but super important job that people don't always think about. And it's just so important. But it's a rest stop. That's what it is. It's a rest area. Okay, cool. Very cool. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, if, if I'm ever driving up and down, uh, which I'm going to call it, uh, the, the East Coast on my way from Florida up to Maine, um, and you see me, make sure you wave. Indeed, indeed. I'll have, to be up, I'll have to be real close to you. But if you do see me, you do recognize me, I'll probably be the one bitching about how far the drive, drive is. But make sure you say howdy to me, and, uh, and that's good. But uh, anyways... Will. I 
Oh, wow. Okay. So you would want to get a differing opinion from that one just to have it on file. That way you have a variety, a diversity, if you will, of opinions in medical. Yeah. And here's why you want a different doctor because you want a different opinion from the one that's being presented by their doctor. That way, when they do a weight of evidence test, you can claim that you have a, a basically a, a specialist for eyesight that said this, that way, if their doctor comes back and says, Hey, there's improvement and Hey, there's this or that, you don't have to deal with any of that crap. You've got your specialist, your specialist has their report and shows that you're not doing well. Right. So you, you want to have right, your, so yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, but the thing is this, you want to always have different doctors because remember, if you have one doctor, it's much easier for that one doctor to be written off as a wave of evidence situation where they say, well, you know, from this year through this year, this doctor's seen him and we're going to only give this you know, uh, a, a less, we're going to give it a lesser evidence standard because, you know, we feel that the record wasn't consistent or they didn't do this or they should have done that. And they didn't do this test, go get a different uh, eyesight doctor that way. You know, I literally say this, having a, a diverse pool of medical professionals is crucial because it cuts off the ability of the SSA to say, Oh, well, this doctor was all they saw. And this doctor isn't good because of ABC. But if you got a doctor and another one, then you've got two doctors that you can pull from to say that they are the standard, not the one that they sent you to being the pro SSA okay. doctor. Yeah. Okay. So now what about the C, what messy, uh, uh, the, the CDR form? Yeah. So you just, you fill it out. Uh, if it's a long form, short form, you just fill it out, you send it in. It, you know, they're not, well, they, you know, they send me that. Yeah, they, I get this, send me that about November or something. Yeah, you'll get that in the mail. You, you'll probably be a short form real quick, you know, quick update, send it in, and then they'll, but 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 do have one doctor review yourself and uh, uh, whatchamacallit, make sure you outline all of the ways that your eyesight with the good eye is limited because you want to be able to explain each and every little limitation about how you can't use that eye to track objects, to be able to, you know, see color correctly, to be able to, you know, differentiate between, you know, uh, different textures or distance and stuff like that, because your whole thing is to show that you would not be able to function at a full-time higher paying type of job. Well, what about the one I'm doing though? I, I do about, I do about two, uh, two or three hours at man. Well, here's the thing. You can get away with that because it's a blind SGA and a blind person's SGA is higher. And the bottom line is that you are able to up close interact with things as you clean with as you clean them. But if you were to do a job where you had to stare at something that was 10 feet away, like a monitor, and then differentiate what's on it, that ain't going to happen, you know? Remember, yeah. your, your goal is to stay on this and achieve 67. You achieve 67 with this, you get max retirement. That's your goal. Yeah, I know, but I don't, I know, I know, I sure wish I could, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm, a try, I, I'm trying, though. Yeah, that's my goal right there. You're Perfect. Right. Sounds good, good, sir. I will catch you a little bit later. I'm going to take the next call. You have a wonderful, wonderful night. Okay, now when are you going to run this right here so I can hear it? Oh, uh, to the video, the video is running right now. So if you, uh, if you just go to the channel, the general like disability resolution channel on YouTube, you'll I'm see it. Oh, it's probably a different video. Yeah. We're, we're live right now. Like if you go to the main channel, like you'll be able to see like the continuation of this show. Like, and, and then, and then once the show is over, you can actually like rewind and go back to the very beginning of it where we went through details. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Appreciate it, man. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Perfect, guys. We're going to go ahead and take some, the next caller, which is, boop, there we go. And we're going to click the little speaker button. And hi, this is Attorney Walter Not. We are live. Remember to mute the computer on your end. Um, remember to use a fake name throughout this process. And here, I'm going to take it off of this thing. So real quick, just make sure you mute the computer on your end. We are live. Use a fake name. And would you like me to answer a specific question or would you like me to run hearing questions with you? Go ahead. Question. Um, I talked to you a couple months ago about my sister, um, about she not get a full SSI. And she draws off my father. But how come she isn't getting a full SSI? 
Uh, okay, so not much information there. I don't remember the claim, but all right, let me go through this real quick. It's your sister. She's on SSI. She's not getting full uh, benefits. How much is she getting per month? She gets six ninety eight for SSI, and then she's two forty nine, I believe, for my dad. Okay. But my dad's gone, but she's been getting from him since she was baby. Okay, so from when from when she was a baby, or when she was like eighteen to yeah. twenty two? No, when she was like three years old. Okay, cool. All right. So, okay. Bottom line is this. Uh, so what, what was the total amount? Because it's late. My brain isn't doing math at the moment. What, what's the total amount? Um, about 949, 949, I think. 949. Okay. So that's still more than the SSI amount of $914. But remember with a lot of these benefits, when they do an add on for SSI, it's not stackable. They're not stacking the benefits on. So she's probably getting a reduction in her SSI benefits. Uh, which, okay. So is anybody like helping her or paying for things with her or assisting her with food or rent or things like that? She gets a food card. Yes. Okay. She gets a food card, but does any like family member assist her where like, you know, she gets a cheaper place to live, stuff like that. Well, we share the rent utilities and all that. But so, she pays her. Okay. So without looking at the accounting sheet where they say, okay, you're getting this much because of this and this much because of this, I can't know exactly why they're reducing her SSI. It could be a couple of things, but remember, she would get $914 on SSI alone. They're stacking on top of that uh, some auxiliary benefits from the parents, Title II. So kind of the bottom line here is she's still getting more than the 914 she would just get on SSI. And it's never stackable. It's just where one benefit is used to boost it up to a higher amount, just around a thousand bucks, which is what she's making. So um, the reason it's somewhat important, but not totally important that she's not getting full SSI benefits isn't really destroying or hurting her that much because she's getting boosted from the title two benefits from the father. You know, so at the end of the day, it's, it's not, you know, are you, if you're expecting her to get like, you know, 1200, 1300, 1400, $1,500. Yeah. Okay. So she's, she's probably getting around what she's supposed to, but look, here's the deal. If you get her accounting sheet and you email it to me and then you come on the live show again and you say, Hey, I emailed you. Here's the first three letters of the email. I can look at it right then and there and tell you why they reduced her benefits and gave her a, a, a smaller amount for the SSI and then use the title two from your father's benefits to bolster it to be just above the SSI amount. Okay. I did ask him once, um, social security and they told me every state's different. So I don't know. They didn't really answer my question. Anyway. Well, that's ironic too, because they're actually trying to like the video I did just before this, they're trying to yeah. across the board. Uh, there's like seven States right now that treat, um, the one third reduction rule for rent, when it comes to the maximum value rate, um, they, that treat it one way and they're trying to get all the other states on board with that, that would then get rid of or reduce how much they reduce the SSI benefits. So I would expect within the next two to three years, the rule that's probably reducing her benefits will actually be changed. Okay. I'll do a video on that rule though. Cause it ain't, it's math. It's mathy. It's very mathy. Cause you have to look at what the actual rate of rent is supposed to be at the fair market value. Then you have to look at what the person is paying. Then you have to subtract that and then use a portion of that as income countable in the one third reduction rule against the amount that they're actually supposed to receive as the maximum benefit rate. It's mathy. So I'm going to do a specific video on that. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Perfect. Keep doing more. Thank you for everything. Absolutely. You have a wonderful, wonderful day. You too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So I just want to say, Deb Carter, thank you. Thank you so much for the $10 donation. I really, really appreciate it. I'm putting a little heart on it. Very cool. Very cool. So, okay, real quick, we're going to take the next phone call. Um, we're going to do a couple more phone calls. Um, there's there's a lot. There's a lot that were missed. We're going to take this one because it's uh, quasi at the top. Let's get this one going. Uh, let's see what we got here. Speaker phone is on. Let's see if we can get this person on the line. Watch the one I call back. Don't, won't pick up. Come on. Hi, this is Attorney Walter Not. We are live on YouTube. Would you like me to answer a specific question or would you like me to run hearing questions with you? And just remember to use a fake name throughout this process. Go ahead. 
Okay, hi, how you doing? Um, uh, we'll just call me Frank for the moment. <laughs> sure. And, um, uh, basically, my question is, I, I have uh, a claim in. I'm sorry, let me mute you on the phone because I'm getting kind of a feedback on my, there we go. So basically, I have a claim in. I haven't been told whether or not I have uh, <clears throat> been denied or approved. But I was wondering, I was watching your program, I think it was last night or the night before. It was that, I don't know when it was done, maybe a couple of weeks ago, wherein you indicated that, you know, because all of these long time frames, and it sounded like the uh, reconsideration, if I'm not approved, could take, you know, a year to 18 months, and then a hearing could take another year or so. And my question was going to be, and I do have an attorney, and I'm sorry I didn't find you first, so you would be my attorney. I think no, you're no amazing. I yeah. love watching your programs. But anyway, sorry, getting back to my question. Um, so if I were to be denied, would you recommend or uh, have, have any input on whether or not uh, I should ask my attorneys to to uh, keep me from doing the reconsideration so that I could go directly to hearing my hearing, thereby maybe reducing my time frame from a year or 18 months to just what it would take between, let's say, a denial and the hearing. So, um, yeah. So basically, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I th that was my question, sir. Um, so basically, some states don't have reconsideration like that, uh, you know, that actual, like, you know, step. Um, so just as a heads up, um, but the bottom line is you have to, depending on the state, uh, follow the administrative docket as it is provided by whatever that state requires. So, um, okay, real quick, um, which state are you in? Um, actually, Texas is my state of residence, but because they were so inundated with cases, they moved my case to Arkansas. So basically because Arkansas apparently is under the, let's just call it jurisdiction because I don't have the right vernacular here, but under the jurisdiction of Texas. So um, they, I believe, were collecting all of my medical information, whether or not the DDS in Arkansas is going to determine, you know, whether I'm disabled or not. I don't know. Or once they get my medical information, if they're going to send it back to Texas DDS. Okay, so the way it works is the state that you live in is the state that you follow for the administrative procedures for the docket of the SSA, which means that Texas does have reconsideration stays. So there's no way to like skip recon. Like it's, it's that's, you got to do recon. Um, and just for everybody else who's watching, um, everybody calls it DDS except for Georgia, which calls it DAS, which has the most God awful phone system on earth. Try reaching a DAS rep in Georgia. It's like... Pfft. It's like trying to summon a monster. But point is, for Texas, you have to do reconsideration there. Um, there's no way to skip it. And the only way to really expedite the claim is to use uh, the four, or sorry, the I-2-1-40 rule. Uh, again, I-1-2-40 rule. Uh, and there's a subsection A, and then there's like six potential. And there's some military ones. There's terminal illness ones, compassion allowance listing ones. Uh, imminent homelessness, um, you know, uh, their suicidal, homicidal ones, stuff like that. But the bottom line is that um, you would unfortunately have to go through the reconsideration step, uh, which is very similar to the initial filing step. You just basically get a, a different DDS person in a different room adjudicating the claim. But sometimes it goes in front of the same manager, uh, although it would be nice to have it be in front of a different manager. So um, the, the thing is this, uh, even though you may have an adjudication in a different state, you're still bound by the state in which you are currently residing in as your uh, rules for adjudication uh, to have recon. But, um, and, and remember too, Texas, Texas is a long way state like Florida. That's, that's one of the tough things about it. Okay, and I have a, another question. Does it make sense if someone is capable of doing so from a financial perspective? Does it make sense if, you know, you're denied, you decide to, okay, I'm going to move to one of these states where, uh, you know, does it seem like maybe Alaska 
there at like a 69% or so approval rate or whatever, according to what I've Googled. Does it make sense to move to a different state that you know that um, they, they have a record of, you know, approving disability um, uh, claims? Oh, because Texas is down near the, oh my gosh, you know, you're lucky if you get it. You know what I mean? Whereas there are other states that, that will approve you much more quickly. Um, how do you, how, how would you answer that? Would that require a whole new claim or could you just say, hey, I've moved. You need to send my stuff somewhere else. So you can move. They can move your local field office. It would change the venue sort of situation for this. The, and yes, you could do that. But Alaska, Alaska claims now a 50%, 56% approval rating. But be careful because Alaska was known up until last year to be the widow maker that would never approve disability claims, FZs. They had very few judges, and I'll tell you exactly how many judges they have there now. Um, but they, they were in like the 20, 30 percentile range for passing. And the only place that they have a hearing office is in Anchorage. And Anchorage basically has three ALJ judges. Those judges, let's see what the percent passage rate total. Uh, no, now it says list of nine judges. Maybe they've increased the amount of judges, although they have no percent passage rate. So bottom line is they're saying that these judges in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, let's see, 56% approval rating, but Alaska overall has a 46% approval rating. So what I would say is this, I would not trust Alaska because for the longest, for, for ever since until like last year, they were one of the lowest percent passage rate states. So unless they swap the judges out or something happened or and it's a permanent swap out, I would be careful with that. The always safe state, other than, of course, there being a massive fire there, for it taking longer to be approved, but the likelihood of being approved is very high, is always Hawaii. But they're at a 521 days of average processing time, but they've got a 55% approval rating. Now, Alaska's right now at a 56% approval rating, but like I said, they used to be the cleaver. Like if you were in Alaska, the likelihood of getting approved was extremely, extremely poor. So if I go through and I pull out basically the highest percent passage rate state right now, let me see what it is. Hold on. Doop, doop, doop. It's Alaska. I wouldn't trust that though. There's not enough judges. And frankly, up until recently, they were always the worst state for approval. Next one is Hawaii. Let me see which one is down from there. One sec. A 49% approval one is Michigan. Michigan also has a very short wait time, 9.5 months, 352 days. Uh, judges have a processing rate of 2.2 claims, which is very quick. Um, they have also have a low percentage of cases dismissed. Uh, so let's see what we got here. Another good state right now would be Tennessee. A uh, little bit of wait time, 11.3 months, 401, 401 days of processing times. 35% uh, uh, denial, 16% dismissal, 49% approval rate. So that's pretty good. Uh, Oklahoma, another one. Oklahoma, again, 11.3 months, 399 uh, days to process, 49% approval rate. Now remember, the national average used to be up above 50%. Now it's down to like, let me see what it is. It was 44%. Yeah, it's still 44%. So they, every year, make it harder to be found disabled. And you can tell that by the percentage of approvals that they do. So, you know, keep in mind, like if you're looking for speed, the fastest state would be, hold on, give me one second. I'll look it up right now. Doop, 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 doop. Um, South Carolina is pretty fast, 8.3 months. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see. Let me just scroll a little bit more. Yeah, that's going to be your fastest state right there. 8.3 months, South Carolina, 320 days processing time. Judges pop out about two decisions a day, 47% passage rate. That's well above the national average. Oh, and by the way, Texas is fast, 9.6 months, 337 days of processing time, 2.3 decisions per day, 18% uh, dismissal, 41% approval, 40% denial. So they're below the national average a little bit on the denial rating, but they're nowhere near as bad as places like Rhode Island uh, or perhaps, let me say, another, an even worse one is Montana. Uh, and like I said before, uh, Kansas is really bad. Um, but Alaska used to be the worst every time, every, everything. So 
just be careful with that one. There may be new numbers. They may have swapped out judges over the past year, but they used to be the worst. Okay, so just to just to to reiterate, because I have trouble remembering things, I'll I'll be rewatching this this um, this I'm sorry podcast that you're doing right now. Sure. But so would this be to reapply? Or would I just need to move there, say, hey, I've moved and I'd like reconsideration from this new state that I may or may not, that I may move into. And obviously, I'm going to take your recommendation on uh, what you've said here and make a decision between those states, because at this point in time, I do have the financial capability to do that. Um, I don't know how long that'll exist, though, if I don't get it. And I just feel like, you know, it's an investment. You so, know what I mean? So here's the kicker, too. What you got to keep in mind is that when you get adjudicated, they are so low on DDS drafts because that is the main body of people that's essentially quitting uh, at the SSA. So they're taking literally administrative staff from OHO, the ALJ and the AC levels, and putting them at DDS levels, which is why we're having these like super bright, super capable, like amazing processing people at the DDS level, but they don't have enough people. So the bottom line is, if you go ahead and transition prior to appealing, they may just keep you at whatever the DDS group is that is, that is actually adjudicating you. And they may, even if you go up there, send you to some other group, some you know national processing, we have availability here, DDS area in which case they might take additional time. So the rules of like moving to a state and then automatically having adjudicators specifically from that state that's local to you know the area around your local field office, those days are over because they're sending DDS claims wherever they have available DDS reps. So just hang in there. Would your recommendation be stay with Texas, go, go through the process and you know, I guess I guess I'm just, and I know that's a, a, an unfair uh, question to you. It's a big question. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. if, if, if it were you, let's just put it this way, with everything you know, would you stay with where I am or would you take the risk? Um, well. Knowing everything you know. Yeah, honestly, that would not even be really a disability question for me. That would be like, a, where am I? How how like invested into that area am I? Like, do you own a house, a home where you are in Texas? Um, okay, so let me ask you questions. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so do you do own a house in Texas or no? I do outright. Okay, so and keep in mind, most claimants that ask me this question that want to like, you know, get the benefit of the state, they usually have a friend somewhere else that can say, hey, they're living there when they're not actually there. So assuming legally that this is not that situation um, and you were like, hey, I actually have to move. Selling a house right now is a terrible idea because of the interest rates. Just absolutely horrible. Um, Texas also, uh, from a political standpoint, um, is a good place to be for 2024's excitement, because as long as you don't live in the cities, things should be relatively calm and safe. Whereas if you move to some of these other places, it's going to be a fireworks show in 2024. Like I, I was just telling my sister, uh, you know, basically that she needs to be extremely careful when she does her traveling for medical, um, you know, her CLE credits, whatever they're called for the for the for the veterinarian field, that she has to be extremely careful in these cities um, that are that are very charged cities. So um, that's something to consider because remember, we're 2023 in a year or 2024, we're, we're in the middle of all that stuff. Um, whether you're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't really matter. It's just you got to be safe. So um, the other thing I would say is this. Um, if you look at the judges, let me look at the judges real quick in Texas, because ultimately you're probably going to have a Texas judge if you do uh, in-person hearing. If you don't do in-person hearing, you could end up with a judge pretty much anywhere. If it's video telephonic or telephonic, a judge could be literally anywhere. So... Man, Texas is huge. They got 24 judges in Dallas downtown, 28 judges in Dallas North, Fort Worth 10, Houston downtown 14, Houston North 14, Houston Bissonette. How do you pronounce it? Houston Bissonette? Bisonette? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I do know it would either be downtown or north for, uh, for my, my county. Dallas or downtown Houston? Dallas or North Dallas. North Dallas? And I know. Yes, sir. And I believe between the two of those, one of them's great and the other one is horrible. So wait, we got 
yeah, we got North yeah. Dallas at 45% approval rate. What was the other location? Um, at downtown. Downtown. Dallas downtown is 45% approval rate. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you, you right. okay, so here's the split. Dallas downtown, 18% cases dismissed. Cases approved is 45%, which is the important number. Cases denied, 37%. Dallas North has 19% uh, cases dismissed, 45% cases approved, and 36 cases denied, percent cases denied. So um, Dallas North is faster for the judges to pump out decisions uh, by just slightly. Um, Dallas North is much faster for processing claims. Um, there's also four more judges in Dallas North than there is in Dallas downtown. So the bottom line is, if you're at Dallas North, I wouldn't move at all. I would not move at all. You're at 45% approval rating. Um, that is, other than Dallas downtown, literally the highest in the state. You look at Fort Worth, they're at 38%. You look at uh, San Antonio, they're at 39%. Yeah, no, that's not. Okay, well, that's all very good news. Walter, you are absolutely amazing. Mm. And I do have an attorney, but I see that I can give you $100. So uh, I'll be wow. sending that your way once we get off the phone. And thank wow. you so much. And we do need you. And I don't know why there aren't thousands of people on here. But um, you definitely deserve it. And all of us who are... We just couldn't thank you enough. You know, I have an attorney. I've had one for over a year, and I've learned more from you in a single podcast. I never hear from them. So just God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. You know, and thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's been difficult. I got I, I you know I had this one claimant. I got a really quick story. I was I was having a really tough day because I had like eight claimants in a row call me with not well organized stories and they were just all over the place and they weren't, I couldn't get the information out of them easily because it was either, uh, you know, brain, brain trauma or they were abused as a child, or they basically just, they couldn't, they couldn't put the piece together that I would ask them questions for. And then this other gent called me and he was just telling me about his story, about what he went through in life and how uh, I was able to help him and things like that. It was just, it uplifted me because, you know, I get down sometimes during the day with some of these phone calls um, but I really appreciate that. Um, you know, you don't have to donate. I, I always appreciate them, but there's no, you don't have to. Um, and then basically, um, if you ever want to run hearing questions, don't be afraid to, uh, uh, give me a call, uh, during the live and we'll go ahead and run some hearing questions and uh, get you ready. But, um, just as a side note too, um, with your top five impairments, if you want to reach out, you can always reach out and, uh, I'll give you kind of some auxiliary types of evidence to shoot for, to go ahead and bolster the claim. Yeah. Oh, you're amazing. Thank you so much. So you don't mind that I have another attorney? Um, I can still reach out to you. Yeah. So I have a, and I will pet give you because I'll tell you what your time is valuable. You spend all of this time with us and your time is valuable. And if I had spent this much time with my attorney, goodness knows it would probably be 150, 250. Okay. So you do deserve to be paid for all the good you do. I know that's not why you do it, but you still deserve it. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, no worries. We'll, we'll get you rolling in the right direction. Um, and uh, other than the heat of Texas being very, very bad, it, it, it should be okay for your adjudication, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. God bless you. You know, I'll be happy when I hear your house is, you know, um, you know, all fixed and everything. And I'll keep watching. Thank and you. And I'll tell everyone I know to watch. I don't know anyone, but I'll tell them when I see them. That's perfect. <laughs> no worries. Well, thank you so much, ma'am. You have a wonderful, wonderful night, you know? Yeah. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That, that really helps me guys. Cause that, that lightens me. That makes me feel good, uh, about basically helping people. Um, we, uh, we get, there's another call, but I'm going to, I'm trying summer. Um, let me just take, okay, I'll take the call, but, um, here we go. Um, hi, this is attorney Walter. Not we are live on YouTube. I remember to use a fake name throughout this process. Would you like me to answer a specific question or would you like me to run hearing questions with you? Go ahead. Hi. Um, I live in Colorado. Okay. And uh, I put in an application on my own without the assistance of an attorney. Sure. And um, I got I got put on disability in 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to be transitioning to uh, from from disability. Uh, I'm currently under Medicaid. I'm going to be transitioning to Medicare in uh, the first of the year. 
And one of the one of the things that I'm I'm concerned about is um, I, the longer I stay on disability, um, the longer the period is where I don't develop any credit. So if I were to get kicked off a of disability, you're about to ask me a really good question. This is a good question that I'm so glad you're asking that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So um, my my question is really, uh, if I were to get removed from disability, uh, how would I regain the status if I don't have the work credits to reapply? This is one of the most sneaky, devilish things that exists in the system. And somebody brought it up to me like three weeks ago about like what is being done about it. And here's the reality. There's the thing called the DLI, which you know about, which is the date last insured, which, you know, as you earn quarters of coverage, you need 20 quarters of coverage for the past 10 years. A current quarter of, quarter of coverage goes for, uh, hold on, 2023 quarter of coverage. I always forget what they are. It's uh, $1,640 that you earn and pay taxes on. You can get up to four of those puppies per year. So if you take $1,640, uh, let me pull up the calculator because remember it is 10, 13 PM and I'm supposed to be watching star Wars. Uh, so it is one thing <laughs> I'm so excited about that too. I didn't even realize that came out, but, uh, so that's going to be a total of $6,560. So if you earn 6,560 bucks in a single year, you get four quarters of coverage, you pay taxes on that. Uh, you can get the max four quarters of coverage per year. Now, the bottom line is when you stop working because you're disabled, you go on to SSDI benefits or SSI benefits, or any of those programs, but in this case, it's SSDI benefits. The bottom line is that you are no longer usually having taxable income, or you might be having a smaller amount. You might be doing a, you know, only one or two credit or you know, quarters of coverage per year. So the bottom line is the only way to really balance the effect of this so that if they do a CDR and kick you off, and the problem is then your date last insured is way into the past. So if you reapply, you're stuck with SSI. So the kicker is the only way to really do this is to have a job where every year you earn at least one quarter of coverage to keep it rolling forward every single year. So every year you got to earn at least, you know, in this year, 2023, it's $1,640. Uh, if we do it by year, I'll tell you kind of where they were. Uh, so if you go over here to, let's see, images, they're probably gonna have a graph on it. Uh, the graph says, let's see, here we go. So 2023, oh, they don't have the most recent ones in this. Hold on. Uh, one second. By year quarter of coverage. You know, that's one thing the SSA needs to really improve upon is their uh, little number thing. All right. Well, anyways, uh, quarter of coverage amount uh, for 2021 was $1,470. 2020 was $1,410, 2019, $1,360. But the point is every year it becomes more expensive to buy your way onto disability benefits. And wow, somebody just donated hundred dollars. That's huge. Uh, Tamara Nuri, that is, uh, and I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, but that is absolutely massive, massive, massive. Wow. So wow, that is huge. Um, Teapot did $100 in the prior video. Uh, we also had a $10 donation from uh, one of our amazing uh, viewers. But I just wanted to say real quick, that is uh, absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Thank you, thank you for the $100 donation. Um, that's that's huge. Um, so to answer uh, your uh, question, you have to play. Okay, so look, here's the game. You get nine months of trial work period. That's, you know, that you get to play with during a period of time. And so what your goal is to do is basically spread that out, uh, you know, where you have a large chunk of earnings for one particular month, you know, per year. That way you get your full quarter of coverage amount out of it. And if you can utilize that, then, you know, basically you can essentially, you know, spread out that nine month trial work period. The other kicker is you can just kind of, you know, have a month where you earn over SGA or just, you know, because remember, if you if you look at the uh, quarter of coverage, you know, by 2023 year, uh, that amount is one thousand six hundred and forty dollars, which is strategically directly more like slightly more than the one thousand four hundred and seventy dollars where they say you're not disabled for the month. So the point is, if you have one month 
where you basically don't receive benefits because you're earning over SGA and you earn that quarter, quarter of coverage, then you're going to lose benefits for that month. So what most people do is they earn smaller amounts over multiple months that are under SGA that add up to uh, basically at least $1,640. But otherwise, right. the, the point is you have to keep having little earnings coming in to get your quarter of coverage one per year to bolster it so that it continues to roll forward as time continues. So that basically, if you get kicked off as part of a CDR, you can still fight your way back on in case they are successful in completely knocking you off. Now, that's crap point number one. Crap point number two is that if they kick you off, you are not protected by the original rules that you were found disabled under. So like what year were you found disabled? Uh, 2021. Okay, so that, yeah, I mean, the rules sucked in 2021. They've been sucking since, you know, uh, basically, you know, 2016, 2017, when they really started the change. So you're stuck with crap rules anyway, so don't worry about it. But the point is, some people who were found disabled seven, eight years ago, you know, they were they were doing they were in a much better spot than most people are now. So, yeah. Well, I was concerned because I didn't use an attorney. I just filed the paperwork myself and made the application. And, and and then was surprised that I didn't get denied. I got approved. Mm -hmm. And my my award letter indicated that I would be up for a uh, five to seven year review. Mm -hmm. And and that was um, that's that's what brought this. I mean, in, in seven years, I will have reached early retirement age. So I, I would already be um, I, I don't I don't. Yeah, they'll probably I, tag I'm you once. Sure that... Yeah, they'll probably short form you once, and then basically you'll transition into you know early retirement. Well, no, you're SSDI, so you're going to roll into full retirement. You're just going to stay on this until you hit 66, 67. Yeah. So. So so I mean, um, my my particular condition, uh, there is no cure. Okay. It's a, it's a lung, a progressive lung disease. Um. And, and uh, there's quality of life changes that are available to me that I, I, I worry would, would change my status. I don't know. Would a lawyer have been able to tell me how I qualified? Well, yeah. I mean, so what you want to do is if you want to figure out why you qualified, you basically um, – so here's the problem. You used to be able to call the local field office and ask them, hey, what kind of approval did I receive? But a lot of people have been reaching out to me and saying, I tried that and it didn't work because they didn't know what my approval was. And they told you know, basically the people to go ask an attorney or you know, go get, the, you know, get their um, approval documentation and then go find an attorney and ask them. The, the thing is the local field office is supposed to be able to tell you what kind of approval you have, whether it's a vocational allowance, a grid out, a, you know, listing level or compassion allowance listing. Or maybe it's like one of these little sub caveats where it's like, you know, the, uh, you know, blue collar worker rule or it's the, you know, 301 rule or whatever. So point is um, you would have to look the, the thing that is worth its weight in gold to tell you what happened at these initial filing and reconsideration steps is to go get your DDE. But they many times do not want to share that. So if the attorney requests it, they'll send it out. But with the person requesting it, sometimes they won't send it out. So you might have to do a um, Freedom of Information Act to request the DDS you know, uh, report, which is the DDE, the Disability Determination Explanation. The DDE is what tells you why they did what they did to give you benefits. Would I make that in the state in which I'm getting benefits from? Would you make that in the state? Uh, wait, ask it again. Uh, so you... Uh, Requesting the DDE, is that at the state level, my local uh, uh, field office? Where do I make that request? I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it the state level because it's a federal office inside a state. But it's, okay. yeah, you would, you would, you could make that with your local field office and submit uh, specific. They have a specific form where you can, I forget the number on it, but uh, hold on. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, Let me see Thank if I can. Thank you very find much it. for uh, helping the community. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, I think is it this one? Um, t -t 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 yeah, so it's the SSA. Oh, where's the code? Where's the? There it is. SSA three two eight eight PDF three two eight eight PDF. 
Uh, you're going to request the disability determination explanation. But if you want to be cool when you call them, you tell them the DDE. <laughs> okay. And, and if, if I get if I get kicked back, then I would probably want to talk to somebody such as yourself. Yeah. So if you get kicked back, you got a couple options. Uh, you can talk to somebody like me, or you could file a Freedom of Information Act. Um, it's only been 2021, so they've still got that. Like if somebody's from like, you know, I was found disabled in 2001, they might not have it because you know after a certain amount of time, some of the documents get erased, but. Uh, bottom line is this, um, you should be good to be able to go ahead and request that document. However, keep in mind the local field offices, not super trained right now because they're hiring on a lot of new people. And also, uh, bottom line is that they are super busy trying to process everything. So, you know, something like this is going to be very low on the processing poll. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. Good, sir. You have a wonderful, wonderful night and, uh, hopefully everything will go well with obtaining that DDE. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, guys. So I'm actually, um, I know I know the phone is still ringing. I, I totally get it. Um, so here's the deal. Uh, those individuals that I did not catch up with tonight because I'm just super tired and I'm, I have to go watch. I have to go watch that show. It came out. I've been wanting to watch it. This thing is right next to my face. So what we're going to do is um, next time, please remember every Thursday I go live from eight ish to 10 ish, usually around like nine ish. We do the video where I go live and basically answer questions for people where I just donate time. The big thing is this. Um, I wanted to do a status update on a couple of things. Oh, please remember to like subscribe and, uh, leave a review on Google. You can leave whatever review you like. I of course request, uh, you know, that you consider a five star, but if you don't want to, that's fine too. Uh, bottom line is this. Um, okay. We've done a ton of these little $250 where people buy an hour for basically $250. Here is my summary on how those are going. First and foremost, in the morning, if you do one before 12, I am usually very hyped up. So if you schedule it before 12, if you're looking for me to just hammer information into your brain during that two, you know, that hour for 250 bucks, do it before 12, do it before noon. If you're looking for a more relaxed version of me where we're having more of a conversation, do it afternoon after I eat, like after one o'clock. Okay. Then I'm more relaxed. If we do the hour, basically after five, usually it's a crap show. It depends on how my day went. And remember it can't be right after five. We did one right after five and it was okay, but we, we like do it at like 6 PM, 7 PM. Cause I need to have a little, like, I have to have an unwind period after I do the regular day's work. So those are going super fine, super duper great. Um, I will catch you guys uh, a little bit later. Uh, please remember to take care of yourself. Amazing. I mean, the donations were massive and I really appreciate it guys because um, I'm trying to like fix my life because I don't make enough as a display attorney and like, like doing that house over there. The whole purpose of that was like to realign me with like trying to fix my financial situation. So bottom line is um, that's, that's uh, we do have the kitchen videos coming out soon. And the kitchen, I hope you guys like. It's very modern. It's very cool. It's very like hip. So it's it's actually nothing that I actually chose. Everybody chose things. I had a lot of great ideas. All were rejected, um, but it doesn't matter because it turned out great anyway. So, um, which I've learned with with restoring a house, as long as I don't make aesthetic choices, it turns out really really amazing. But if I make choices as to knobs, handles, this, that, it turns to shit real fast. Like, I don't know. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. Like, I just don't have, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I, you know, ah, you know, like, um, you know how like with women's clothing, they have so many options and men's clothing. It's easy. We got a shirt. We got an undershirt. Like that's that this is that's this part of the body. You know, we got, you know, so. Um, but houses and doing like the whole like mixture of colors and textures and how high things are and how they look from an angle and from this room how does that room look and do the colors intertwine between the ah what a, yeah good luck anyways i will catch you guys a little bit later please have a wonderful wonderful day um and uh t paw good to see you give me a call um tomorrow and other than that guys uh, i will catch you uh a little bit later i'm sorry i didn't catch any of the questions that were in the chat section um but please 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 oh oh i forgot I'm thinking about doing a live every Tuesday night on Facebook. And I was thinking about having a night 
where all I do is answer written questions in the chat section. Like we go live, they write it in the chat section. I answer them. We go from there. Um, let me know what night you think the answer questions live would be a good option. Um, let me know if you think Tuesday night for Facebook would be a good option. Um, we are setting up the Twitter account right now, or the X file. Um, and, uh, we'll go from there. Anyways, guys, I will catch you later. Please have a wonderful night and, uh, we will go from there. And, oh, final note. I am, I am going to, for the first time in 15 years, pick up the guitar and do a video where I actually play guitar. And I, I just wanted to apologize ahead of time if I, if I hurt you while I'm doing that. So I'll catch you later and we will go from there. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night. Bye-bye guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.